Hello, my friends, and welcome to a, another episode of Philo's Fighter. But this time, I'm going to try something a bit different. Rather than a vlog about my own training, I'm going to take a specific martial art and talk about the philosophy behind it. Martial arts offer a cornucopia of different worldviews and philosophies that both come from and respond to the cultures that they are born out of. And this time, I want to start with Capoeira. Now, the book I'll be reading is Capoeira, The Art of Survival by Mestre Preguisa, who was my mestre when I trained with Omulu Capoeira in Long Beach, California. And I'm not going to read the entire book, I'm only going to read a few sections, but I'll have a link in the description below where you can find the book for yourself if you would like to learn a little bit more about the mentality and the techniques of capoeira that are in this book. I'm going to focus mainly on the philosophy and not on aspects of uh, the fighting itself or the music that goes into creating capoeira, which are, which are all very important uh, to what it means to be capoeirista. Uh, but as we go through, fair warning, my Portuguese is very poor. I don't really practice it as much as I should for someone who wants to continue training capoeira. So my pronunciations are not to be taken as the correct pronunciations of Portuguese words. Uh, but before that, let's go ahead and get started. Chapter 1. The Origins of Capoeira The exact birthplace of capoeira is questionable. While it is undoubtedly a mix of African and Brazilian influences, its community has debated much over what degree each cultural group influenced its development. This book discusses three major theories to illuminate the roots of this unique art form. Regardless of the exact origin of the physical movements, its philosophy grew out of a reaction to an unjust and repressive system. It is certain that the history of African slaves in Brazil is inextricably entangled in the evolution of capoeira, where an outright challenge to the status quo in the face of death, trickery and sham were vital then as they are today in the game of capoeira. Therefore, a brief discussion on the history of the slave trade and the institution of slavery will further our understanding of the circumstances that shaped capoeira. Theories of the Origins of Capoeira One hypothesis of capoeira's origin is that it grew from the Angolan zebra dance called Ngolo, performed by young men during the female puberty rite. The best zebra dancer could take a wife without paying the dowry. An Angolan named Albano de Neves e Souza once described the African's dance as the tradition of fighting with their feet. The similarity of many rituals found in the African diaspora and performances executed in a circle to music similar to capoeira support this theory. Additionally, the fact that the berimbau, the one-stringed instrument central to capoeira, as well as the accompanying atabak, or drum, are both found in various parts of Africa. This further strengthens the hypothesis that this art form is primarily of African origin. Others support a second theory. Capoeira was not born in Africa, but it was developed in the senzalas or quarters where Africans and slaves from different cultures likely spent their leisure time and shared their traditions of music, dance, and language. Capoeira may have sprung from the synergy of African cultures. If this is so, it must have been created after 1600, which was the first time that Africans from different regions were together in Brazil. A third theory claims that capoeira arose in the quilombos or villages of escaped slaves set up in the bushes, and in fact many capoeira songs contain references to them. It is theorized that it was developed in these quilombos and spread to other slaves by the recaptured runaway slaves. A popular myth illustrates that the inhabitants of these free cities used capoeira to withstand the attacks of the Portuguese and were able to turn into animals or catch bullets with their bare hands. Zumbi, the last king of Palmares, was reputed to be a capoeira master. While parts of this legend seem improbable, others may be based on truth. 
Certainly, the trickery at the heart of capoeira may have been used successfully to resist invasion, and the idea that bird calls were used to communicate is perfectly plausible. It is important to note that these theories are not mutually exclusive, but rather could all have contributed to the development of this art form. The Angolan zebra dance may have been an embryonic form of capoeira that was further developed in the Senzales and later in the Quilombos. One mestre, or master, may have summed up current speculations most succinctly when he stated, Capoeira is like an infant conceived in Africa, but born in Brazil. Etymology of the word capoeira The word capoeira has several meanings. Michaelis Portuguese Dictionary's first definition of capoeira is new growth of shrubbery on cleared land, scrub, brushwood. And the second is means of self-defense, or dance. Today, it means not only the game played in a circle, but also the person who practices the art form, since capoeira and capoeirista can be used interchangeably to indicate its practitioner. Interestingly enough, the word itself is not African origin. The first meaning is thought to have evolved from the Brazilian indigenous Guarani word cau puera, defined as new growth. Using this definition, it is speculated that either runaway slaves escaped to the bushes where they practiced capoeira, or that slaves played capoeira in the bushes during their free time, hidden from the inquisitive eyes of the slave masters. Capoeira is also defined as a cage or basket for chickens. Stemming from the Portuguese word capao, meaning a castrated cock, it is thought that slaves often played capoeira during their spare time at the poultry market. It is also noted that the game can resemble a cockfight. The capoeira bird native to Brazil and other parts of South America is the subject of the final theory. This plump yellow bird lives in the bush, or capoeira, and has a distinctive song, which was imitated by hunters, shepherds, and cow watchers to call each other and their animals. Those who used this call were cor excuse me. Those who used this call were called capoeiras. Again, there is a notable resemblance between the game of capoeira and the territorial fights in which these birds engage. In chapter two, capoeira as resistance to slavery, slaves cunning and freed blacks income. For most of the history of Brazil, to be a capoeirista or a practitioner of other forms of Afro-Brazilian culture was to invite sanctioned repression by the forces in power. Slave owners discouraged capoeira as a martial art because they believed it was a threat to them, a fact that led perhaps to the popular theory that capoeira was disguised as a dance to fool the masters. Unlike the United States, Brazil had a large population of free blacks and mixed bloods during times of slavery. Slaves were occasionally able to buy their freedom, while those with lighter skin due to racial mixing could buy their freedom more easily. The upper class also looked down on free blacks, who also practiced capoeira because they were seen as hoodlums, bums, and conmen. While Brazilian society loathed capoeiristas and their seemingly vagrant attitude and rejection of steady employment, it must be kept in mind that more respectable means of income were often denied to capoeiristas due to racism or poverty, leaving the ability to live by cunning as their only salvation. In a situation where deception and scams were critical to one's survival, these abilities take on a positive connotation and cultural significance. Thus, qualities such as malicia, malandragem, and mandinga, all meaning a type of cunning and originality thought of as pejorative are highly valued in capoeira. The capoeira hora is often seen to be representative of the world and the game inside to be one's life. The traits necessary to survive in the outside world were recreated within the art. Slaves were not on equal footing or in a position to follow the Western ideal of fair play. The viewpoint developed during slavery that taking advantage of your opponent whenever possible for example, kicking the opponent when he is down, resulted from slaves taking on their master, a much more powerful opponent. The Persecution of Capoeira In 1808, the Brazilian Empire was created, 
supposedly free from Portugal but still ruled by members of the Portuguese royal family. With the change of government came a crackdown on those who were conceived to have disrupted peace, the capoeiristas. Capoeira provoked the ire of the police, sparking widespread persecution. Laws prohibiting loitering and vagrancy were often unsuitable disguises for breaking up horas and punishing the capoeiristas. The new Brazilian emperor created the Guarda Real de Policia, the Royal National Guard, headed by Major Miguel Nunes Vidigal. Major Vidigal ushered in a reign of terror for the marginalized. A skilled capoeirista himself, he used his fists and feet, sticks, knives, and razors. A fearsome fighter, he appeared unexpectedly at Samba, Quilombo, Candomble, and his main target, Capoeira Horas. However, Vidigal's iron fist did not extinguish Capoeira or even reduce the number of altercations between Capoeiristas and the police. Battles against the police and other Capoeira groups were commonplace. Capoeiristas used a special Burimbao rhythm called Cavalaria to alert players that law enforcement was coming. This was the cue for everyone in the street Oda to scatter in different directions. Unfortunately, Capoeiristas did not always help each other out, since they were often affiliated with rival Carnival dance troops. One notable exception to Brazil's persecution of Capoeira came during the Paraguayan War from 1865 to 1870. Because slaves who fought were granted their freedom, large numbers of slaves volunteered to fight. Many of them were Capoeiristas, who demonstrated their skill at combat helping Brazil by means of the very art it was trying to kill off. After slavery was abolished in 1888, Brazil became an independent nation in the following year. At that time, Minister of Finance Rui Barbosa had all, excuse me, had all official records related to slavery burned, supposedly executed to extinguish the black stain of slavery from his Brazilian history. A more likely reason for this action was the government wished to avoid paying compensation to former slave owners. As a result of the destruction of documents, such a record of entrance, sale, and taxes, much of the history of Capoeira was also lost. The end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s marked a dark period in the history of Capoeira. In 1890, a law was passed specifically outlawing Capoeira and threatened practitioners with a sentence of two to six months in jail and a doubled sentence for leaders. If Capoeirista were convicted for another crime, being a practitioner of the illegal art increased the sentence. The Guarda Real was able to virtually eliminate the art in Rio de Janeiro and Recife, Recife? And Recife by the early 1900s. Until 1920, it remained illegal to practice or teach it. Officially, offenders were to be punished with flogging and up to six months of hard labor. However, countless capoeiristas simply disappeared without a trace. From Chapter 3, The Development of Modern Capoeira Capoeira Regional Without doubt, the most influential capoeirista of this era was Manuel dos Reyes Machado, born in Salvador de Bahia on November 23rd in either 1899 or 1900. Two conflicting pieces of documentation have been found. His father, Luis Candido Machado, was a well-known batequero, I'm sorry, uh, batuquero or practitioner of batuk, batuk, uh, a game played in a circle to music in which two dancers try to sweep each other off their feet through blows to the legs, hip throws, and other takedowns. Manuel began learning capoeira angola from Bentio the captain of a maritime company, when he was 12. At that time, there were no academies or even formal classes. Students learned during their free time from mestres at the dock or in the streets. Rarely would an individual have more than one or two students at a time. In fact, the term mestre was not even used. Manuel studied with Bentillo for four years, and he grew into a large and powerful man. He was a natural leader, a formidable fighter, and a stern personality. In 1918, after four years of training Capoeira Angola, he began teaching. By the late 1920s, he decided he wanted to create a style 
that would be a more effective personal defense. To do this, Manuel, or now better known as Mestre Bimba, incorporated elements from Batuk as well as inventing many new movements. Unlike the movements of Capoeira Angola, which emphasize trickery to such a degree that actual contact is often considered bad form, Mestre Bimba's repertoire included takedowns and punches. He opened the first academy of Capoeira Regional and the fifth Capoeira Academy of any kind in 1932 in Bahia. In 1937, the government officially recognized his Centro de Cultura Fisia e Capoeira Regional, mainly because he had portrayed it as a center for physical education. Until that time, Capoeira had been considered a pastime of lower class thugs. Mestre Bimba legitimized the art in the eyes of society not only by founding an academy with formal classes, but also by creating an organized teaching style. Students who arrived at his classes received an illustrated pamphlet containing 14 lessons along with a recording of the songs and rhythms. This pamphlet was the first written material published about Capoeira. Along with these, the rules of the academy were prominently posted on the wall. 1. Don't smoke. Smoking is prohibited during training. 2. Don't drink. The use of alcohol inhibits muscular metabolism. 3. Avoid showing your friends outside the Hoda your progress in Capoeira. Remember that surprise is the best weapon in a fight. 4. Avoid conversation during training. You are paying for the time spent in the academy. Observe other fighters, learn more. 5. Research the Jinga always. Pra number 6. Practice daily the fundamental exercises. 7. Don't be afraid to approach your opponent. The closer in you are, the more you learn. 8. Always keep your body relaxed. And 9. It is better to learn in the hoda than in the street. It was not so easy for Mestre Bimba to legitimize his new style in the minds of other capoeiristas because they saw his innovations as a corruption of pure capoeira. In 1936, to prove his fighting style to the world, Mestre Bimba issued a challenge to anyone from any martial art. Four men from various disciplines accepted his challenge and were knocked out immediately. The longest bout lasted 1 minute and 10 seconds. After this showing, Mestre Bimba was given the nickname Tre Pancadas, three hits, because every one of his opponents would go down by the third hit. Mestre Bimba was victorious in this and other fights, supporting his claim that no one had ever taken him down. Because of these many innovations, Mestre Bimba's academy attracted many middle and upper class students to an art that had been stigmatized as a lower class activity since its inception. Today, capoeira is one of Brazil's national sports. Chapters 4 and 5 are focused on the music and the culture behind capoeira, which is where a lot of the most interesting aspects of capoeira philosophy are found. However, I'm going to be moving on to chapter 6, learning how to play capoeira. Uh, to explore those chapters, you'll simply have to find the book yourself. Chapter 6, Learning How to Play Capoeira So much of the magic of capoeira has to do with the energy of the hoda, the rhythm of the songs, and the mestre playing the berimbau. Occasionally, even the physically impossible is accomplished within the circle. Often a student will leave the excitement of the hoda not even seeing or feeling any injury until well after the game. There are reported instances of a physically handicapped person who entered the hoda and whose limitations literally disappeared as the energy of capoeira carried him throughout the game. It was only when his game ended and he left the hoda awkwardly that his handicap showed. On one hand, capoeira consists of only a few basic movements, and on the other, the subtle variations and precise execution of the movements make the combinations boundless. Capoeira movements are clearly defined through exacting rules of tradition, yet it can also be expressed using a high degree of individual interpretation. Nevertheless, it is essential to seriously study and incorporate the physical mechanics and style of capoeira because these movements form the building blocks for any future development in the more advanced levels. A fortress can only be big and strong as the foundation upon which it lies. It is strongly advised to keep your practice well-rounded in all areas of capoeira. 
The more confidence and quality you develop in a variety of movements and styles, the more options of response you will have available for each situation in the game. Although it is common to witness seemingly endless variations of the movements, the basic movements of Capoeira are quite simple. It is important to remember that a very good and secure game may be played with just the basic movements, though serious training of these basic movements and concentrating on speed, accuracy, reflex, and balance, students head down the path of a respectably competent game of capoeira. In fact, despite the typical desires to acquire newer, even more complicated moves and combinations, in reality the vast majority of students have not adequately explored the realm of possibilities and implications of the basic moves. There is an old capoeira saying that states, your biggest advantage is also your biggest disadvantage. In other words, do not fall into the trap of relying on your strengths too heavily. A common situation finds a beginning student who is endowed with great strength or speed and finds it easy to play with others close to their own level, while another student has faithfully concentrated on basic forms and techniques. Inevitably, the day arrives when the latter student will effortlessly weave circles of confusion around the former student, who in turn finds that their mere strength or speed is no longer sufficient to match the opponent. In the same vein, it is valuable to train with less advanced students because they have plenty to teach even experienced capoeiristas about being prepared for the unexpected and learning to control movements. Be careful, the element of predictability is shattered with beginners. Attempting to coordinate a flowing game with beginners requires highly tuned reflexes and great flexibility in strategy. In addition, the advanced student has the responsibility of not injuring the beginner. Mestre Pregrisa always stresses that the beginner is allowed to do anything in the hoda, but the advanced student is responsible for all the mistakes in the game. In conclusion, a good capoeirista can play capoeira with partners of all levels of ability. Training Capoeira Upon seeing capoeira for the first time, people are inevitably impressed with the free-flowing grace of the movements. The motion never stops. With attacks, counter-attacks, defenses, and fakes, the action of capoeira unfolds. For the newcomer, it is very difficult to discern where one movement begins and another ends. In an evolved game, the attacks and defenses are tightly interlocked. The two players synchronize movements with breathtaking speed and accuracy. Rapid kicks, leaps, ducks, spins, sweeps, jumps, and flips blend seamlessly with grace and control. People often wonder if the game is choreographed, but capoeira does not consist of premeditated moves. It is a spontaneous interaction between two people who follow the rules and traditions of capoeira and yet are prepared for the unexpected. As essential as this practice is, however, it is meaningless when it is taken out of the context of the game. Training capoeira is not capoeira. It can only be considered preparation for it. What happens inside the hoda? That is real capoeira. To further one's development in this art, it is imperative that one seriously studies how and when to initiate these movements in relation to your opponent. It is important to remember that, while physical conditioning and strong movements are necessary, capoeira is not a game of force. It is that of concentration and intelligence. Capoeira is a game of wits, with moves, countermoves, defenses, and fakes. Students who possess only a handful of basic moves, yet who have an intrinsic sense of timing and strategy, will usually find that they have the upper hand in a game. Therefore, it is the combination of the repetition of basic movements and practice with your opponent inside the hoda that forms a good foundation in a game of capoeira. Inside the hoda. When the vibration of the berimbau calls, one must answer. The music of capoeira channels one's entire consciousness into the present moment and outside distractions dissolve. One should be able to play with anyone who kneels across them under the berimbau. Each level, each challenge, and each personality has always something to offer and teach a student. A sure sign of a good capoeirista is one who can create the most out of each situation. Welcome each opportunity to create and learn. With practice and calmness, 
Many difficult situations can be turned around to become a moment of great opportunity. Remain relaxed but alert. Perceive the unseen. Develop the intuition. Let no detail go unnoticed. By training with an open mind, personal wisdom gained from every facet of life outside the Hoda can contribute to a successful game in Capoeira. Before jumping into the Hoda, one must always tune oneself to the energy of the circle. When kneeling below the Barimbao, never expose any self-doubt towards the opponent. Instead, take advantage of the moment to center oneself and to tune into one's intuition. This will allow one not to overanalyze the game once it, excuse me, once it is about to play. Once within the Hoda, keep moving in order to utilize the space in its full dimension by giving and taking, moving up and down. Try to get around the opponent to control their space. Move them to the edges of the circle, therefore limiting their options while maximizing one's own. In this way, one can maintain focus on the general perspective of the Hoda and, at the same time, keep the opponent busy dealing with insignificant distractions. It is important to get an understanding of the disposition of the opponent. How does the opponent react to the given attacks? What kind of speed, rhythm, direction, sequence, and techniques does the opponent prefer? Probe his weak points. Once these objectives have been accomplished, move the opponent away from their familiar traits of strength and confidence. Just as yawns are contagious, so is boredom or carelessness. Instead of playing their game, force the opponent to play the game on the other's terms. Now, one is in control of the situation and has defined the mood of the game. The opponent is now busy reacting and defending himself on unfamiliar turf. While some capoeiristas employ a sharp initial surprise attack very early on in the game, others do not hurry the process. Instead, they savor the game as a cat toys with its prey. If one allows the opponent to spend their energy on useless movements, soon their resources and reflexes will dwindle. Should the opponent develop a strong attack, one should have several options. One may feign weakness so that the opponent relaxes after the attack and so has the opportunity to execute an effective counter move. One may simply flow together with the opponent so that their energy for an attack disperses and totally evaporates. Or one can calmly await the opening that often appears during an attack and swiftly move directly into the opponent's vulnerable area. In general, it is always best to think offensively rather than defensively. If the opponent attacks and one focuses on a proper defense, one may very well have protected oneself from the opponent's move. However, one will have done little to improve the overall situation or to further develop the game. By contrast, if one focuses on an offensive action, one will still have to defend oneself against the attack. But the mind will not stop there. Rather, it will automatically work to transform the current situation of one's advantage. One's long-term aim in Capoeira should be to develop such a refined style that one can make a conscious decision to respond instantly with direct force should the situation arise. This can either effectively end the game or allow the game to continue by showing the opponent their mistakes, by coming close to striking or taking the opponent down, or by allowing recovery only to counter with another attack. It is this kind of intricate control that is vitally important to Capoeira. There are many steps in the learning process to reach this level. Typically, a student develops their skills in stages, perfecting the movements, predicting how an opponent will move, and finally, influencing what moves an opponent chooses. In other words, the game of Capoeira actually begins to transcend the physical plane. In advanced levels, Capoeira transforms into a mental game. This departure from the physical reality is apparent when watching a capoeira mestre well along in his years play a young athletic student. The student may possess strength and speed in his movements, yet is no match for the simple cunning of the mestre. The mestre, who can no longer rely on physical strength, must instead depend on strategy and mental superiority to defeat his opponent. A mestre can expertly create illusions because he always sees things exactly as they are. He becomes a liquid target, 
leading his opponent to commit to moving towards something he thinks is a solid target, then simply takes advantage of his opponent's commitment. The student often becomes disoriented or even blinded by the carefully woven spells of the Mestre. Mestre Pregrisa has often claimed there is no winner or loser in the game of capoeira. Perhaps this statement is deceptively simple. It may be more accurate to say that capoeira is a game of cunning and humility. It is not always the person who squarely kicks his opponent who wins the game, nor the injured person who loses. True capoeira reveals itself on a level far more refined than this. It is a game of finesse, trickery, and technique. It is the art of creating an illusion, making the opponent appear foolish, while one smiles and effortlessly dances in circles around the prey. Should one find oneself humbled within the hora, capoeira requires that you accept this humility with grace. Everyone experiences moments of defeat or humiliation. Keep eagerness for revenge in check. One's chance will come at the right opportunity. Never be arrogant. Instead, appreciate the lesson the opponent has offered in the game. It is how defeat is accepted that more accurately reflects a capoeirista's expertise. The road of capoeira is a long, never-ending path of learning. It seems that the further along one moves through the path, the more one realizes how much there is to learn about life. There are no real shortcuts. It is only through discipline that one learns to reach deep within oneself and discover one's unique inner strength. From Chapter 7, The Capoeira Movements Floreo Movements Floreo movements stress beauty and grace and tend to be acrobatic. However, they are much more complicated than simply mastering a series of flips. A good understanding of the mechanics of floreo movements is apparent when it is incorporated seamlessly with the basic moves, and also when particular attention is given to one's performance in relation to the opponent. Almost any type of forward or back flip can be integrated into the game. The moves described here are the classic floreo moves unique to capoeira regional. As mentioned before, your eye should never leave your opponent while playing in the hoda. Also, only the hands, feet, and head may ever touch the ground. It is always impressive to be able to integrate floreo movements into an aggressive, high-speed game while having security and control of the opponent. If one is able to flip and circle around the other, thoroughly confusing and throwing the opponent off balance, one has proven that the utilized floreo movements were executed well in the game. It is also important to combine these movements carefully so as not to interrupt the game just to perform acrobatics. The berimbau dictates the style of game to be played. Capoeira has a special rhythm called luna, which is specifically played for floreo. This is one played for more advanced students. When Luna echoes from the Burimbao, the spirit of the Hora changes. It is like the male bird calling and the female bird responding. The two capoeiristas should concentrate on playing together, trying to help their partner look their best, and disguising any mistakes the other may make. Clashing or threatening each other to the point of breaking the rhythm of the game is not considered proper form. In Luna, the goal is not only to show your individual skill, but also to showcase your partner's ability, making the entire game a work of art. From Chapter 8, The Rituals of Capoeira The Baptizado Baptizados and graduations are found exclusively in Capoeira Regional. Neither is found in Capoeira Angola. A baptizado, or baptism, has traditionally held when a student entered the Hora for the first time, utilizing basic kicks and defense techniques against simple attacks that were learned beforehand. In the Hoda, the newcomer played against a mestre or an advanced student who challenged them by grabbing, sweeping, and tripping them off their feet. In Mestre Bimba's academy, this was done during class time. A formatura, or graduation, was a separate event in Mestre Bimba's academy. Students who had completed their course of study were given blue scarves to symbolize their graduation from the academy. Nowadays, the baptizado is usually coupled with the graduation ceremony. During the baptizado, a student is still challenged by a mestre or an advanced student to a game in the hora, although the student has already played in the hora during class beforehand, and is still taken down. 
Another part of the ceremony is giving a student a Portuguese name. The naming is based on the way a student plays or looks. Oftentimes, the nickname usually makes fun of some aspect of a student and should not be taken seriously. Originally, nicknames were used in Capoeira Rodas to protect the true identities of the players who were marginalized and were often wanted by the law. Currently, the Formatura is the ceremony of promotion that recognizes the hard work a student has put into the art, and therefore is promoted from one belt level to another. This graduation ritual is often done in a ceremonial way in which students are called two at a time to receive their new belts. Before kneeling under the berimbau, the students walk around the inner edge of the hoda while the mestre plays the capoeira anthem created by Mestre Bimba. Sometimes a few words are said about a student who has overcome particular difficulties in the art of capoeira or life in general. After all, the graduates have received their belts, they play in the hoda with each other and with students who had already achieved the same belt level. Unlike other martial arts, promotion does not depend on a test in which the student must perform a set combination of movements. There is no specific move that must be mastered per level. Their game is evaluated as a whole. If one aspect of the student's game is weak, it may be made up for in another area. For example, if a student has a limited acrobatic game but is a strong fighter, that student may be promoted based on the overall quality of their game within the hora. Final chapters discuss different aspects of living as a capoeirista as well as training as one, and also talk about and discuss the uh, history and tradition of Amulu Capoeira and the mission of Amulu Capoeira and what it tries to provide to the communities that it's a part of. Uh, if you have the chance and were interested by anything you heard, I only read a small excerpt of some philosophically interesting aspects of uh, Capoeira that were highlighted in this book, but I did not even read nearly a third of what the book has to offer, so I highly encourage anyone who is interested to look at the link below, find the book where you can. If anything you've heard or read in the book interests you, I would highly encourage that you try to find a capoeira community that's near you. The capoeira communities are growing ever faster and are spreading around quite rapidly, so while there may have not been one before, there could very well be a new community that is forming near you right now. Part of being capoeirista, or part of the philosophies of martial arts in general, is the experience of actually living that martial art as a lifestyle, living combat sports and the culture that surround them as a lifestyle, and philosophy about martial arts develops through that culture. So it's important to not just read about it and learn about it uh, on the books, but also to participate to have an embodied understanding of what the culture means and what the philosophies are trying to be represented as. If you enjoyed this video, please, by all means, hit all the YouTube buttons below, like, comment, and subscribe. Subscribe if you'd want to see more videos like this every week, mostly focusing on video games and anime, but sometimes I take time away from those things for other interests of mine, like martial arts. Uh, if you also would hit the like button, that would mean a lot to me because the like button is the single best way the YouTube algorithm has to make sure this video gets in front of other interested viewers. Thank you again for watching, and as always, stay true.